This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter. At Pepe Sayer, we focus on quality. So if someone comes into your restaurant and they see you're using Pepe Sayer, they know immediately that that is a quality product you've got in front of you on the table. And that comes from a decade of just doing quality butter day after day. For more information, go to pepisayer.com.au. I'd like to acknowledge Australia's First Nation people as the traditional custodians of the land, and for this episode in particular, the Wiradjuri Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I think it was understanding who, who was going to be open to drink, trying a wine from a person in a place they'd never heard of. You know, it was that idea of um, people acknowledging that there's potential all over the place. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Sam Renzalia is a third generation winemaker located out of Bathurst, New South Wales. Sam and his father Mark have made great bounds for the uncharted wine region. Their reputation for quality wine continues to grow and expand. Hi Sam, thanks for joining me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Shante. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. It's always great to have a sit down and chat with you. How's the weather out in Bathurst today? Uh, it's a bit patchy. It's often a uh, very... Um very variable out here it can be raining one minute and rainbow the next and then sunny for the next hour and then raining again that's kind of where we're at at the moment it makes it hard to prune but you know you just deal with it and go under cover every now and then if you have to so lots of tea breaks or lots of coffee breaks then uh, uh, any excuse for a coffee <laughs> That's very true. Actually, I just drove through Bathurst and it was uh, absolutely cold and miserable the last couple of days. And I imagine, yeah, you've got brilliant sunshine. So I can understand that that kind of temperate weather. Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's definitely cool where we are in O'Connell, actually, which is 20 minutes um, south east of Bathurst on the way to Oberon. It's rolling hills out here and you get even more kind of a bit, it's, it can be a bit gusty from time to time, but at the moment it's pretty still. So, yeah, you do see a lot of those changes in weather, um, which, you know, add, add to the, the feel of the place, that's for sure. Now, you're third generation winemaker. Tell me about how you and your family got involved in the world of wine. Oh, uh, yeah, well, um, my dad, Mark, um, was born and raised in the US. Um, his father was an Italian immigrant. His mother, a Canadian. Um, they met in Minnesota, and um, they lived most of their life in Carbondale, Illinois, which is where my grandfather was working at the Southern Illinois University. He he retired from there as a um, rehab, um, you know, occupational therapy professor, and being a you know Italian through and through, um, wanted to make his own wine and took it upon himself to start one of what was then one of the first vineyards in the state of Illinois. Um, back in 84, they planted the first vines in Alto Pass, which was a dry county at the time, which raised quite the uproar within the community. And uh, that was when, um, yeah, our family really first started working uh, in the wine industry seriously. My dad went back in the 90s to help expand Alto Vineyards. That was when he got the taste and um, my mother, being Australian, convinced Dad to move back here in the 90s. And I think the whole vineyard thing's been Mum just, um, uh, you know, giving Dad an outlet uh, to feel a bit of a connection to home, also to explore his passion. But your know, Mum's also always kind of, I feel like that was a bit of a thanks, Mark, for giving up your life in um, in the US to to come live here with me in Australia and um, that was her kind of saying, all right, well, I'll have the real job. You can do that wine thing and you know, he, he held on and <laughs> as a hobby, it was a hobby up until 20, uh, 2005. My dad started at Wimbledale, which was one of the many vineyards and wineries that was established in the late 90s, early 2000s throughout um, New South Wales and Eastern Australia. Uh, Dad was there until 2011 when he went out on his own, um, started Renzalia Wines as a sole, um, you know, occupation and focus. Uh, at that point, he started leasing Mount Panorama Estate uh, in the middle of the famous racetrack um, and also getting 
fruit from our home vineyard, Bella Luna, at the same time, um, and making the wine at Vale Creek Wines, another little local winery. Um, so we were leasing a vineyard and a winery, making a small amount of wine from our own fruit. And um, in 2016, I came on board under that same kind of uh, business um, arrangement. Um, and in 2019, we left Vale Creek and built a winery on our place in O'Connell. Um, and we're now making all our wine on site here. And we are also expanding the vineyard here. Um, we stopped leasing at Mount Panorama there for a while um, over the drought fire years. But now we've just started again this year and we're leasing another vineyard in between here and um, in Lithgow in an area called Jamala. So we've got three vineyards now we're looking after and expanding the winery and that's kind of the f- whole story. So I think we can probably end the podcast now. Is that, that all you wanted to hear? <laughs> <laughs> you did sum that up incredibly well, I have to say. But a fascinating story about your dad in Illinois, because there's like over 200 wineries there now. So he's certainly not, you know, new to um, being a pioneer and doing something a bit out of the ordinary, both in Illinois and now in Bathurst. And of the handful of wineries that you have in Bathurst, Vale Creek and Mount Panorama, you know, You've also, you know, your dad's had his hand in both of those too. So really sounds like he he's somebody that um, pro- probably knows exactly what's going on in every place that's happening in Bathurst and, and the surrounding regions. He's definitely the Bathurst wine guy, that's for sure. Oh, he's um, He's been in the only kind of person who was around during the inception of the wine industry in Bathurst and it definitely had its bubble. There was probably 10 or 15 different people giving it a crack there in the early thousands and that's definitely condensed down. Wimbledale still um, operates under new owners, um, Val Creek in the same manner. Um, there's a few other little local vineyards around, Grass Parrot, Bellbrook Friends, Rock Forest. There is a wine industry here. Um, I think we could call it I don't even know how to pronounce. How do you say burgeoning? I, I, I can spell it. Bur- burgeoning? Burgeoning? How do you burgeoning, say it? Burgeoning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, it's that. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, you guys have had so much to do with that. And I think um, I remember first hearing, actually, you were the first person to ever walk in the doors through key and show me some wine and I was like Bathurst as in where there's car racing you know and I was like I could be wrong it's probably Victoria somewhere and it's just got the same name Um, but it sits in the central ranges of New South Wales and like you said you're in the village of O'Connell but what makes the area of that central ranges area suitable for grape growing? Oh well I I always think talk about Bathurst as being a great um, balance between cool and warm um we're a very cool place it gets down to minus eight in in the winter and it can get very cool um i I don't i wish i was more scientific i don't know what our growing degree days are but um it's a cool region but it also gets it gets just as cold as a region like orange in the evening but it's slightly warmer during the day so you get a little bit more donal range so um and you can get a we, we generally harvest Chardonnay and Cabernet here in Be- at Bella Luna at a very similar time to a lot of the orange uh, wine, um, well, vineyards, I should say. Um, but we do get a little bit more concentration. I think we can get a little bit more power, maybe not the same amount of acidity, but we have that balance between um, warmth and um coolness but also we're talking about granite soils here um and a, and a wide that's that that's as a rule there's a lot of pink granite um and a lot of um clay we have quite a lot of lovely uh, clay with with mudstone throughout it but then you've also got a lot of beautiful patches that have very high quartz content and silica content um you've got some beautiful schisty areas as well huge amount of land that has never seen a grapevine that I get really excited driving through and thinking about grapes being there. And um, so we've also got, uh, you know, reasonable rainfall. It's, 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 it's quite good for organic viticulture. It's not too dry, but it's not too wet either. We get about 650 mils on average. We, we've had about 1,000 in the last couple of years, which is a lot, but um, 
so quite good for organic viticulture as well. I think that's a pro. A big, I, I don't know. I, I've compare ourselves to um, Orange a lot because a lot of my peers are in Orange, and I spend a lot of time there, and we get a lot of fruit from there. But um, you know, I think organic viticulture in a place like Orange is much harder because you've got so much more growth under the vine, you've got so much more disease pressure. But here it's quite manageable. It's doable. It just sounds like there's just so much potential and promise for the future of the region. And it's really you know, quite difficult to say that about a place. Normally somebody's seen that and is got the monopoly and, and bought up all the, all the space. So that's really exciting. Um, and it makes a lot of sense with, you know, you, like you said, talking about Orange, because it's probably the closest wine region to you. But there's such a thing as you know, too much altitude and too cooler areas for certain varieties. And so I think, like you said, those certain varieties like Shiraz that need a little bit more um, sunlight hours and like you really have um, a great opportunity for some varieties to do really well there. Mm, yeah, definitely. There's, and I, I, I'm, um, I'm still figuring that out. Like we're planting a lot of different grapes and, and we'll be making a lot of blends moving forward. And I, I love blending. Um, but there's a couple of varieties I'm quietly confident about, um, Shiraz and Viognier being, being one of them. And we've had great success with Chardonnay. And I think that's, that's a great grape. And that was probably the first of our wines you tried. But I don't think that's necessarily the, the best grape for the region. I think it's got a lot of potential here. But um, there's, there's other grapes that I, I you know, I, I love Riesling. And I think there's some fantastic potential for Riesling around here, but on the right side. And I think that vineyard in... Jamala is is going to be that site for us. Hopefully, it's south facing and a bit cooler and a bit wetter. But um, also um, things like Shannon or Malvasia in the whites or Garganega, for example. I I love alternate varietals, and I, I you know we're putting in some Mamolo in our little experimental nursery. Um, Grenache, Tempranillo, we've got in. And there's great great potential with those two. Grenache is more of our long-term climate change plan. Um, but, I, 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 it's, you know, we can't make one wine out of all those different grapes. It's going to have to be going into a blend and, and um, over time we might find one, one grape works better than the, the other and we might pull that out of a blend and start to make single varietal wines out of those grapes. But that, that that's kind of what it takes when, you, when you're out on your own in a region that no one's ever tried these things in. So, And I, I don't think a lot of growers are have the yeah what's the challenge having the confidence to try something no one's had commercial success with and not not sink too much cost into into growing something that you can't sell but i think blends are a good opportunity to do that and have continuity of product and 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 experiment i can i can see that and i think it's fantastic that you know it not only does it take um experimenting but time and patience to be able to try new things and and it's so worth it because you know you you can ask a scientist or someone that says yes this is designed for this and they might be right but you might try something new and be really pleasantly surprised which we've seen throughout all of Australia that some varietals may not you know technically on paper supposed to work and they do really well so good on you for you know trying new things and, and like you said maybe they'll they'll be the next the next best thing and maybe they won't or maybe they will go into a blend so really exciting times for you tell me about the dynamic between your father and yourself how do you split up the roles in the business uh uh yeah good question uh we, we actually i think we probably we do it pretty well compared to most fathers and sons um i think it, i I'm, I'm probably a bit overconfident at times and dad's maybe a little underconfident at times which probably works in my favor but at the same time i need to check myself quite regularly um dad's dad's very gentle and very passive and he, he's he's not a big ego um and that 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 does help in the father-son relationship i'm probably a bit more assertive and um gung-ho um, which is yeah, if I'm if my ideas are, the, are good ideas and I'm I'm confident, like if it's a good idea, it's it's nice to be able to execute it and have the ability to, um, yeah, more or less get my way a lot of the time. But you know, always, um, we we do we do reach an agreement. We don't. We very rarely walk out in utter disagreement and frustration. That that, that hasn't happened for a while, actually. 
we might spend half a day talking about one minute detail, um, which can get a bit frustrating. Like this morning, we were trying to decide about whether to use wires or, or single posts to train up some bush vines we're establishing, and that took four hours. <laughs> and that was ridiculous, just going around in circles. But that's kind of what it takes sometimes to do, do things as a team, and um, we figure it out. Um, and we don't do things without each other's, you know, blessing or, or you know, agreeing on it. And, you know, if it's desperate, luckily my mum's a marriage counsellor, so uh, <laughs> that helps. We haven't called mum in for a long time, though, so that's probably been a couple of years since we've called mum in. That's fantastic, and it sounds like a great partnership. It's always good to have somebody that's willing to take a few more risks and someone else that's, you know, going to point out perhaps you need to like take a step back or think about things more. So it really does sound like it's, it's built for the long haul. So good on you. In 2022, you were named uh, Halliday Companions Dark Horse Winery of the Year. What was that? What does that mean to you? What was that like? Oh, that was, that was very uh, exciting and, and surprising. Uh, we, we really weren't expecting any kind of, um, yeah, award, to come our way, um, Dad was the one who got the phone call from Tyson. Um, he was out in the vineyard. Uh, must have been months ago now. It was a while before the awards were announced. And um, the he came up to us and uh, to me and Mum and said, um, "We've been we've won this dark horse award. We hadn't really we weren't really that familiar with it and I think they changed how they were awarding it in, in, in 2022 as well because in the past they'd named a number of dark horses or all the people who'd gone from or the top people who'd gone from four to five and under Tyson's new editorship it was just a single winner and so we were going through trying to understand the award and we were like oh no no that doesn't make sense they've always announced 10 and we 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 haven't won it, like. But Dad said, "Oh no!" But he said we were the dark horse, and we were like, "Oh no, no, no! That, that's not how it works. Like, it's they've never done it like that before." And then slowly it sunk in that we had won it, and we, we were very, very proud. Like, we, uh, yeah, and no, I don't know about, yeah, I suppose we were proud. We were very happy, and like we we didn't expect it, and yeah, it was great to see that kind of um, recognition that 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 came throughout the industry. I think that's something that Dad's been. Um, that's you know I think that's more like a career kind of dream comes through true for for dad and to to have started from you know nothing in a in a region and to be constantly have that response of oh Bathurst I didn't know you know wine was from there and to kind of have that industry wide recognition um, that was that was something that was very humbling and very um very you know we were very grateful to have been awarded that and. The the ironic part was that we won got most of our great reviews off the twenty eighteen and twenty nineteen Mount Panorama wines, and then uh, it wasn't it was only months before getting the call from Tyson, we decided with the owners that of that vineyard that we weren't going to lease it anymore because we couldn't figure out a way that we could manage it into the long term and you know uh, get that long term assuredness of the of the site. And so we kind of walked away from that vineyard at that point and we haven't been able to make any Mount Panorama Estate wines since 2019 and, um, you know, you know the Cab Sav, the 2019 Cabernet Sauvignon, um, 2018, sorry, uh, was the one that really got us there because that went into the taste off for best Cabernets in the country and no one had ever heard of us before and... Those wines all sold out in no time when we have no backup stock or anything like that and we were really rebuilding all our stock from the from the ground up after the drought years and the fire. Um, so I think we've probably slipped back off our, our five-star rating this year, unfortunately, because we haven't had our premium wines in the marketplace to get reviewed. We've only had the Dorenzo wines, which are a bit um, more... Yeah, you know, a bit less conventionally made, a bit more, um, a bit, uh, you know, embracing the imperfection, a little bit more of of, of wine, and a bit more, um, you know, bar restaurant focused. Whereas the premium stuff, we're building back, and 
we're building in a mid range between the Dorenzos and our single vineyard stuff, which are which are showing a lot of promise. Um, those wines um, and the single vineyard stuff, Bella Luna. We've only made a barrel of Chardonnay and a barrel of Cab Merlot the last two years because the yields have been so low. And um, one barrel of each, yeah, it's crazy. You should see the amount of work we put into growing the grapes. It's crazy. But um, the uh, that's, you know, we're going to make, we'll have a 1,000 litres of Chardonnay this year and and um, and we'll have Mount Panorama and Wanuka fruit in 2023. So, you know, th- th- those top top wines are, are slowly eking their way back into our range so we're quietly optimistic we can resume our five star uh, rating over in a few years hopefully but it's been a bit of a rebuilding process since winning that unfortunately (laughs) that is the reality of it isn't it is that the ebbs and flows of of vintage and the weather and and like you said with um, awards, sometimes, you know, the spotlight gets sh- shone on you and, and all of a sudden the wine sell out, which is great, but then you may not have this surplus of wine being, you know, smaller and over time. So I have to say, I, I from the time that I met you and saw your wines, I've seen them gradually grow on wine lists and restaurants and in stores. Uh, before Halliday came out, I don't know, I would just slowly see them. And I think that's really a tribute probably to you because you did a lot of work on the ground by go walking in and, and selling the wines. What's the biggest challenge in, in getting people to look at your wines or getting them on the market? Uh, initially, it was the whole Bathurst thing. Um, but I think people are past that now. People are much more – I think it was understanding who, who was going to be open to – drink trying a wine from a person in a place they've never heard of you know it was that idea of um people trusting their palate and not just a preconception of what they might get from the from orange or the Yarra valley or you know mclaren vale or margaret wherever they like to drink australian wine from acknowledging that there's potential all over the place and that in, who knows when they're going to get a nice wine. And I think the biggest challenge was having the confidence to, you know, know that certain people were going to be interested in our story and approaching in, 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 in the appropriate way. But it was really a bit of a chain reaction, I'd say, once. And thank you. I've probably said thank you to you already, but that, you know, the wines getting on at Key were, you know, that was a huge kind of endorsement of our, the quality of what we're doing, um, which then kind of opened the doors. Likewise, at Sixpenny, you know, a lot of people saw the wines on at Sixpenny and Bridget um, and Tommy have both been hugely supportive of, of our wines in there at Sixpenny um, for some time, since for, for four years now. And people see the wines in places like Key and Sixpenny and then they just reach out and it's, it's, it's a bit of a chain reaction, really. And once you start to know people, they introduce you to other people. And now we have Charlie working for us as our distributor of Virtuous Vine, and, and he's doing he's doing a great job. He's got a fantastic network as well. So it just it just builds and builds. But initially, it was just having the confidence to know that people were interested in, in what we had to offer and knowing who those people were so you weren't just kind of sh- shooting in the dark. Well, the, the wines speak for themselves. I think, you know, you do a great job of, talking about them but they did speak for themselves and good to know that um tommy over at six penny has excellent taste which i've i have known but (laughs) Um, (laughs) what in terms of um local you know distribution and things like that do you get a lot of support from the local community in bathurst oh yeah we're we're pretty well placed you know we bathurst is a large community and we're we're kind of the token winery you know we don't have to compete with all the other local wineries to sell locally it's it's quite, if people want a local wine, they'll often just get ours. So that's – we do all right locally. I think a lot of people are surprised. And for a long time, it was probably 80% local. Now we're starting to have more, more sales in Sydney than in, than locally. But that's just because we've grown as a business and, and the market's only so big here. Um, we do a lot in the Blue Mountains as well. And um, I suppose Canberra's the next stop. But we haven't quite started going for Canberra yet. Um but yeah, yeah, no, it, local school. We have great, you know, we've got, um, we've got great local support. We've got um, Hugh Piper and Richard Learmont 
coming out to cater a festival of the pig in a month's time with, with our neighbours, Happy Pig, who have Berkshire pigs, and we're, we're having a, an event out here um, celebrating those animals. And, you know, there's, the tickets have been on sale for just over a week and they're almost sold out now. And, and that you know, that's a testament to the local support we have here. Um, people are proud of what we've been able to achieve, I think, in a, against all odds. And a lot of people have been buying our wine for 20 years, you know, now. And, and not, not, not that many people for 20 years, but plenty of people for 10 years. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you know, we've, we've got good local support. We're, we're proud of that. I think so. I think it's always good to, you know, in tougher years as well, it's always good to have great community support and uh, and then the far-reaching fans as well so on to Canberra next and and maybe Melbourne after that yeah Melbourne's Charlie's already done a bit in Melbourne just through his mailing list but I think there's plenty of potential there I think he was a bit skeptical of what Melbourne was going to do for wines from regional New South Wales but I think we've got to just give it a crack don't we you never know until you try absolutely and the proof's in the glass you know when you pull the wines it doesn't really matter if it's a great wine and it and it tastes great and it does all the right things you know, the rest of the story comes in after that, I think. So anyway, I wanted to ask, um, what do you, what, what do you love most about the career that you've chosen, Sam? I know there's harder days and there's some days where you haven't got a, a humongous team of people and you're doing a lot of physical work, but what do you love most about your job? Oh, it's hard to pick one thing. Um, there's maybe, uh, uh, there's maybe, um, Two things. Uh, one's being outside. I love being outside. I love nature. I love doing as much as I can outside. And I'm sitting at a desk at the moment, but I, I often um, regret sitting at the desk for more than a day or for, for more than half a day. Um, so being outside and the other is the social element of the wine industry. My peers are fantastic, um, you know, Got a great uh, group of friends, predominantly around Orange in the wine industry, and then also the trade in in Sydney. Um, you know, some great peers, and then also just being a part of the the local community and being engaged in something um, that people value, and the, the 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 social capital you have to tell, to 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 communicate, you know, positive stories about working with the land and you know respecting the land. Being part of a you know healthy community and doing events like the Festival of the Pig, for example, are, it's a perfect conduit to bring people together and you know have a positive, um, play a positive role within within our community. I think that social element of it's I value greatly. You, you have said before that you like that wine brings people together, and it really does do, does that, doesn't it? Like a bit like sport and. And food, uh, you know, sharing a glass of wine, you can be completely different individuals and yet sit over a table and have a discussion anytime. That's it. That's it. Cheers. It's a, always a cheers is a good thing. It definitely is. So if you could only drink three beverages for the rest of your life, Sam, what would they be and why? Yeah, geez, I was supposed to prepare for this. I only got so far as an Americano. I love <laughs> oh, an Americano. Drink. It's such a good drink. I love vermouth. I, lo- I love I love Campari. Well, we've done it, made a bit of vermouth here. I think it's a fantastic uh, thing. But yeah, I'd probably go with Antica Formula in my Campari. Ooh. I've had it with I've had it with Sinara as well. It's quite nice. Um, the artichoke. Um, I yep. don't know. Is that a liqueur? Yeah, that one's lovely. Uh, so I love an Americano, nice and refreshing and, and complex and, and delicious. Um, if we were going to go wine, I would probably be drinking a Riesling. I love Maxim Grunhaus, um, probably my favourite. Uh, Moselle Riesling. Um, what's the what's the vineyard called? I can't remember. Anything from Maxim Grunhaus, I'm, I'm a big fan of. They managed to ma- balance some. Um... Oh, you know what? Actually, I take it back. Anything from <laughs> anything from Erziger Wurzgarten, that vineyard. Oh. I think Dr. Hermann and Dr. Lucen. Mm-hmm. I think that's my favourite. My favourite vineyard. So, yep. All right, and on to the third thing. Um, let's go with a, a red wine. I I love um, Norello Mascalese. I, I drank. Um, mm. 
just any Norelle Masculese, I'm still learning about it. I don't have enough authority to say what my favourite one is. I, 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 I'd probably just drink Norelle Masculese. Just give me a different one every time. Is that is that a reasonable answer? Yes, I definitely think so because such an interesting <laughs> grape. And I don't think you need to pigeonhole yourself to one producer. That's just cruel. So Norelle Masculese, great tannins, great... Um, acidity and so mineral and yeah I can totally get on board with that and yeah you've got your kind of cocktail in there and then you've also got Riesling I thought you might say Riesling considering you've gone to, over to Germany and made a Riesling over there as well I thought it's got to be a real true true pleasure of his if he's willing to go all that way so I do uh, love it there's a bit of RS too I don't I like RS in my Riesling just a, yeah. just a smidge just a smidge, just nicely balanced. It's such a good drink, you know, any time of the day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Yeah, that's and right. And in between. <laughs> yeah, in, your, in your coffee, whatever. <laughs> As a mouthwash after you've brushed your teeth. I get it. I get it. Uh, Sam, it's been so lovely having you on the podcast. And thanks for halting your day because I know that you're incredibly busy. So thanks for chatting to me and uh, congratulations for everything that you're doing out there, you and your father. And, and I'm a huge fan of the wines and so should everyone else be. So thanks for spending some time with me. Thanks so much, Shante. Cheers. Cheers to you. This is Over a Glass. I'm Shante Whale. Stay tuned for more stories from the world of wine and drinks. Listen in every Thursday on your podcast app. Follow us on Instagram at overaglasspod and contact us at overaglass at deepintheweeds.com.au.